Sound me. Sounds like you're on like smooth radio. I, I could do smooth radio where you got to talk really calm the entire time. But then you get too excited, I think. Probably, probably. Ah, uh, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Aim a Little Higher podcast. Back like we never left. How's everyone doing today? Good. I feel fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful better than me why how do you feel ah uh, just a bit of an emotional morning wasn't it oh you're so dramatic i think it was so cute really not and i'm deep. actually really sad that you didn't take any pictures but that's the last the last thing i wanted to do was take a photograph i wish i was there for that moment so do i so do i mm, anybody I can't but wait to me see you later anybody but me would have been great for the listeners um dropped my daughter off to school this morning and she got given a big, fat, massive pink bag with a gift and card inside it, which is just... From who? From one of her friends. From her boyfriend. From one of her friends at school. They've they've literally been going out for a whole two years. For two years, I've been like, ah, he's, your, he's your friend who's a boy, yep, I understand. And for the whole two years, they've been going, no... With boyfriend and girlfriend. It's not even a crush with boyfriend and girlfriend because we both like each other. Yeah. I was like, cool. Friend that's a boy. Lovely. Happy for you. Friend that's a girl. <laughs> Happy for you both. over in Egypt. <laughs> Just going to put that out there. So this morning to get that bag and only her get a bag. It was like, uh, and in the line, no one else got anything. I think one lad brought flowers in for, I don't know who it was for, but one lad had flowers in his hand. And that's, that's it. No one else had anything. So... Well, no, a friend that will not be named is setting the standard. Yeah, setting the bar high. And then what did our daughter do? Go and tell her other yeah, boy, yeah, yeah. Eh? <laughs> Look what Noah got me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true. Yeah, I, I, I don't like it. I don't like it, but I like him. And that's the real issue I'm having. That's yeah, why, why do you really like him as well when the last time you went over... So I like this kid, right? The first first few instances, she had like a little issue. He was in there pushing people over for her. That's that's what I like to hear. Aside from that, generally sees me very polite. After school, we play fight every day. He's just he's just a cool cool lad. Um, went to pick her up from his house the other day, and his mum was like, "Oh, they're just in the back. Uh, he's teaching how to play chess." I'm like, <sighs> "I rate that." So what's the chess. problem? Exactly. Not, what not, is the problem? That's the question. Knowing. What is the problem? The problem is he actually called it an inappropriate gift. Can I say an inappropriate? The word inappropriate. Inappropriate, inappropriate to have it a gift. It was a teddy bear. It's inappropriate to have a gift. I don't think a gift was necessary. I think friendship is beautiful and pure, and keep it that way. I think Very you're teddy. just salty that he planned and executed something, and you've had a week to plan and execute something, <laughs> and you just haven't done it yet. You don't know that. Yeah, the seven-year-old did it better. Yeah, you don't know than that. the man who's been married for five years. <laughs> yeah. I might have it all planned out. It might be a big surprise. Ah, I, was, I was pretending nothing's organised. Actually, we're we're going to the North Pole. Literally, that would be worse. In fact, see, so careful what you wish for. Careful what you wish for. Look, I literally have a fear of snow, and exactly. you went the North Pole. <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is, I don't like it. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Don't like it. But like him. Well, I like it and I respect it. He's a good lad. So M- I feel mostly very I torn. respect it. So I feel it's very tough. torn emotionally. I don't like it. But he's cool. Anyway. When I did, and I did ask our daughter, I said, did you want to get anything for him? And her reaction was, no. <laughs> <laughs> I want some more of those pens to make the video, the next story. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> Okay, fair she enough. She was like, don't waste my money on that. No. <laughs> she gets it. She gets it. She gets it. All right. Listen, I've, I've won half the battle then, I guess. But yeah, tough times. Tough times. Oh, there's been a theme going around, um, both both in, I guess, the online world, but also practically as we're going around speaking and working with students of, we keep having these 
incidents happen. So many more hand motions today. Sorry, Carl's got rid of his laptop and like the hand <laughs> motions are out. It's just, you don't know what to do with yourself. I actually don't. I'm normally sat on the laptop and yeah, this is weird. Um, but yeah, there, this, this idea of personal responsibility has been coming up a lot from staff, from teachers needing to help their young people with more personal responsibility different incidents you're seeing online that are going on where you know there's there's incidents and they're blaming each other and it's like no one's taking responsibility for themselves it's the other person etc and it got us to having a bit of a talk a bit of a debate ourselves of actually what is personal responsibility where's the line of personal responsibility and where's the power if you give away personal responsibility so yeah we can start simple we'll start basics with with Back in the day, did you ever do the thing where you decided this subject is not for you based solely on the teacher and that the teacher can't connect with you in the right way? Or the, I don't like the way this teacher teaches, so this subject's never going to be for me. Did you ever fall into that, that trap of putting all the responsibility on the fact that you and this teacher couldn't see eye to eye? Do you know what's really weird? All the teachers that I I didn't like, I ended up picking their subjects for A-level. So I... Fair. So drama the teacher absolutely hated me and like very explicitly as well chose drama didn't I because I was good at it so I was like you're not marking me the examiner's marking me we're fine um history my teacher was an absolute nutcase like he should have been in a a home like he was just bipolar everything every lesson was weird yeah he'd either lose his temper or he would be like really really happy but there was no never a middle ground so you'd either get shouted at or like he'd be your best friend, chose history, didn't I? Um, and what was my last subject? I can't remember now. I did history, English, although my English teachers actually did like me. Um, but yeah, I think there were the, the only subject that the teachers didn't like me that I didn't pick was PE. And, but they, it could make complete, complete sense that they didn't like me. Yeah, I, was I literally hid in a cupboard regularly yeah. to miss lessons. Yeah, I pretended I that I was ill. I sat well whilst fielding. Like I was an absolute nightmare in PE. I was the worst child there, probably. Oh, so you would have frustrated me so much. For me to do A level would have been a crime against them. Agreed. Agreed. So they would have been like, "Please get out." <laughs> and a crime against your teammates. Yeah. This oh is where, yeah. This is where I feel like if we went to school together. We would have got along in a lot of ways, but we would have not got along in a lot of ways too. In that that one, oh, if we were playing at a. a you know that when you play against the other tutor groups and it's a tournament for to be the winners of your year group and they hit the ball and it goes towards you and you're sat down on the rounders field. Sat down. Oh. Well, it would depend what type of oh. weather it was. If it was a rainy day, you'd be quite lucky because I wouldn't be sat down. If it was a sunny day, yeah. Sunbathing. Yeah. Ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Fair. So you had an issue with these teachers. Yeah. Yet chose the subjects. Yeah, it's very weird. Is that because... Actually, you had the issue with the teacher because of their teaching style, but the teaching style actually worked for you and you got really good at those subjects. Or no, I was just quite good at those subjects, naturally. History is about remembering facts and writing an opinion on it. Always been opinionated, so great. <laughs> and drama, I was always quite good at it, come from a family of performers, so mm. I wasn't going to jeopardise what I was good at to do something that I'm not good at based on the fact that we don't get along. Mm. It was just silly, but... Yeah, very randomly, I just picked those subjects and all of the teachers disliked me. <laughs> Fair Fine. Enough. Fair enough. What about you still? I think the only teacher I didn't like was my biology teacher. Did you let that affect your biology lessons, biology grade, biology experience? Not really, because it was kind of a compulsory subject. So it was like, I, I have to do it. But she was weird. Like, I remember... Um, there was this one girl that she didn't like because she was pretty and that was literally her reason and our first ever biology lesson we all walk in and she looks at this girl and she's like i hope you know being pretty is going to get you nowhere in life and it was just whoa it was just so unprovoked like we had just walked in (laughs) first lesson everyone just sat down not even started and she just goes yeah being pretty is going to get you nowhere in life and that's it and like for the rest of the year she just picked on this girl for no reason and yeah she was just like that so that was fun for us Fantastic. Yeah, she's casually doing Paris Fashion Week, like. <laughs> 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 Fair enough. So, you, so you never, neither of you ever fell into that trap of going. Me and this teacher don't get along. This subject's not for me. I'm gonna just part this subject away because of the teacher. If that makes sense. Because mm. that's what we've seen a lot of. You ask students, hey, what are there any subjects that you feel like aren't really going your way? And it'll be, ah, oh, 
I'll never be good at maths. I'll never be good at history. I'll never be good. And when we start to dig into it, they say, well, this teacher can't teach or this teacher teaches like this and I don't get it like that. So I know I'm never going to be good at that subject. And it's like, at what point do you go? Is it the teacher's sole responsibility or have I been given a teacher? The teacher and me aren't clicking for whatever reason. Now I've got to go and take responsibility for this. I made this mistake with maths. My maths teacher did not like me in the slightest. So I was like, cool. That's how you feel. That's how I feel. No problem. I'm going to mess around. I'm going to have a laugh with my friends. I'll have a good time. Got to a certain point where I got moved and, and dropped down in mass groups. And I was like, ah, I don't like how that feels. How do I get back up? And I had to work to get back up, etc. And then eventually realised, okay, I can fix this relationship or I need to go and figure out how to work by myself and take responsibility for getting some decent grades. As opposed to what I'm seeing now, which is where people are just saying, ah, Subject's not for me, I give up completely. What do you think the role of the, the teacher is and at what point does the student need to step up and figure it out for themselves? Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm too strong on personal responsibility, really. Like Storm said, if it's like a major subject and like yours, like yours were all, you had to do those subjects, maths and biology. So it gets to a point where really you have to just teach yourself like we're, we're all fine to uh be nasty about teachers left right and center I think that's just a general thing when we get into senior school we don't like every teacher it's impossible so I think why if we don't like them why are we expecting them to be able to teach at every ability like possible it's just not that's never going to happen. They're not going to be able to teach every learning style. It's physically impossible for one teacher to adapt to every single person's learning style, especially in a state school where you've got such big classes. That's why you have like a smaller a smaller school for SEND students. If you're in a bigger group, there is some personal responsibility there where you have to just go ahead and learn. It's interesting you say like with the whole moving down situation. So in English, I was an A-star student, but... I learnt better in the lower group of English because that teacher was just a better teacher. So I wrote a letter to basically be moved down to the other group. I did get moved down and I still got great grades. Like I got, I think I got A's in the end. Um, but I just worked better in her learning style. So I guess if there's a teacher that you feel like you respond to better, ask to get put into that group. If it is moving up, there's going to be a situation there where you're going to have to work your absolute butt off to get to that class. If it's moving down, it's slightly easier, I think. Um, But yeah, it's and I think like little things like maths is most of the time there's just a right or a wrong answer. I remember I ended up just doing like paper after paper because my math teacher wasn't great. But I knew that eventually if I did like a hundred maths papers, I'd probably, they're, they're the only answers that are going to come up, do you know what I mean, in yeah, some absolutely. maths paper. Um, the other ones that are more opinionated, I guess, are a little bit more difficult. But yeah, yeah, there has to be some personal responsibility. And also for you, you need to know how you learn. So like when you go to uni, you sit in a lecture for an hour, someone talking f- at you for an hour... And it's up to you how you digest or divulge that information. And there's no one sat down with you going through your essays and stuff. So, and when you go to work, obviously you're living the life of work. No one teaches you how to do those things. There might be some processes in place, but normally it's like, here you go, here's a bunch of stuff, off you pop. Um, So you need to know how to learn that stuff. And school is the best time to experiment with that. So take it as like, oh, I'm going to need to be independent more quickly, but great in a way. Fair, what do you think? I think liking someone and being able to work with someone is not synonymous. Like, it's not the same thing. Like, there's going to be mm. people that you're going to have to work with when you grow up that you don't care for or you don't like. But if you're relying on liking someone to be able to function with someone, then you're already kind of messing up because it's just not going to happen. You're not going to like mm. everyone and everyone's not going to like you. And I think people need to remember teachers aren't there to be liked. They're not there to be your friends. <laughs> They're to teach you. It's not about if you if you like them or not it's just about if they can teach you and if they can't teach you for whatever reason like Liza said you've got to step in and be able to either adapt somehow yeah or pick it up for yourself when you get older it's just something that you have to do so I think the first step is to be realistic about the fact that 
all teachers don't like you, first of all. They might not tell you that, but they, a lot of teachers won't like you. And they still, have to, they still have to teach you. So it's a bit stupid to expect you to like all teachers. But if it's in a case where, like, your teacher's stunting your learning, then take the responsibility and go tell someone about it. Mm. Ask to be moved. Report it. Do, do the steps. You can't yeah. just say, like... I don't like this teacher, I'm not going to go to a lesson or I'm not going to try because you're just ruining it for yourself. It, it doesn't affect the teacher. This is the thing with the personal responsibility aspect. It's it's like, okay, well, this person's being paid to do this role that they've trained for. So they, they're going to have some level of, <laughs> of knowledge in the subject that they're teaching you. Now, if you're in there and you're not feeling it or you're not getting that teaching style for whatever reason, once you check out, well, they're still going to, get paid cool their their report's gonna look a bit worse because now one student's not doing well and not turning up but ultimately you hurt yourself and then you get to college and you've got to retake and it only damages you and that's why it should be on you to go this isn't working for me let me go and take the steps to fix this and figure out how how to move forward yeah i've always found it very weird like i know that people don't like people I genuinely don't believe that any teacher wants you to do badly in their subjects, specifically for selfish reasons. Education as a whole is like so based on results, which is quite odd, actually. You don't really think about it, but it's almost like sales targets. Like you need your students to do well, not only for that school's marketing, so it gets the better students, but also for you, how you're graded as a teacher, whether you you're the problem that offset is going into special measures, whatever it is. So they want to see those reports. Normally they hear back from a few students as well. So normally, just based on for their own selfish reasons, they want you to do well. If you think about like where that teacher might want to go if they want to go and get a new job, they have to show statistically, well, the students started off here and I got them to here, just like when you're growing a business, when you're making sales, they don't benefit from you failing. So I don't think any teacher goes out of their way to make you fail, not because of you, because of their own selfish needs. So they might not like you and you might not get along, but they probably want you to do well. And so the moment you check out, they're going to dislike you even more because you're now affecting their job <laughs> and their career path. So like, Mm. don't jeopardize both of you for the sake of a dislike because normally they'll want you to do well so just say i act but don't go your teaching style isn't for me yeah you have to know what your teaching style is then absolutely because otherwise you're just coming up with a problem and it's not really their job to solution your problem as long as you have all the information you can go and find out yourself so come to them and say I've, I've learned better this way or is it possible for you to do this and most teachers if they think you're going to get a better grade yeah to make them look better they'll they might adjust 100 percent. like you look onto the internet there's so many different things available to get subject knowledge that if you said to them actually i learned like this um i've, I've spent this this long studying up on algebra i didn't get it i've used these videos and they've really helped is there any way we can integrate that into the lesson most teachers are probably gonna look at it and go all right like if it's worked for you, there's probably four other students they think instantly it could probably work for them too. So yeah, I completely, completely agree. Get to step to them with solutions and with ideas of how to move forwards rather than just, ah, it's not for me. And I remember coming home to my dad and being like, yo, this math teacher does not like me. He's picking on me constantly. He's always on my case. And he said, all right, when she stops picking on you, let me know I'm going to come down to the school. I was like, Rob, you, I think you're confused. This teacher is picking on me now. Come down to the school and fix it. Like, sort it out. Go and talk to the school. My dad was like, you're not getting it. If she's picking on you, that means she sees something in you that you're not achieving yet. So she's trying to get you there. The second she stops picking on you means she's given up on you and she doesn't care anymore. And that's when I'll go down to school because that's concerning. But if you're coming back to me saying you've been picked on, you've been picked on, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that she's seeing and she's trying to push you forward. And I think even that conversation shifted my whole mindset around when a teacher's picking on me more than other people or when I feel like this teacher's on my case. They're actually probably trying to get me towards a result that will benefit me in the long term. Yeah, plus, I'd say if you really dislike a teacher and you want to spend the least amount of time with them, succeeding is the way to do it. Because <laughs> if you're failing, you're going to have to do less, more lessons, more revision, see the teacher more, talk to them more, have the interaction. 
And if you don't want to do that, why would you then fail on purpose? Because mm. there were so many things that I didn't like about maths, for example. It wasn't my teacher, but just maths. Mm. And I didn't want to have to retake it. So the option was to not fail it. And Fair. that's what I did to not do that. But I'd also say that a lot of people say they dislike teachers. And what they mean is, I don't like that that teacher doesn't let me get away with what I want yeah. to get away with. It's not that you don't yeah. like the teacher. It's like you don't like the fact that she's telling you to stop talking or not sitting with your mates or making you turn up to lessons or giving you detention because you didn't do your homework. Mm. So it's more like, I don't like the fact that I've got consequences for my actions yeah. rather than I don't like the teacher. Yes. And isn't that the whole issue we have around personal responsibility? That when you take a certain action, it's going to cause a certain consequence. And you might like or dislike that consequence, but you've got to stop and go, did my action contribute towards this consequence that I'm now experiencing and, and I don't like? And that's, that's a scary direction I'm seeing that I feel like we're going where we're getting concerned with, with the actions of others and we're not pausing to go, well, hold on, what have I done to contribute to this situation? And getting rid of all personal responsibility and once we start you know it's their fault it's their fault it's their fault you take you lose all power because now you've given it away to everybody else and this goes way beyond school this is just in your general life as a person especially in the adult world that actually you've got to understand that everything you do has an equal and opposite reaction and if you don't like the reaction maybe you should assess what your action was initially yeah i think that's where like the power it's so interesting. People talk about power all the time. Like, where where is the power? And even in that conversation that we just had before we started, like, the whole jealousy thing, where does that power stay? Mm. So I was saying when I was on the pill, I was an absolute psychopath, but the power was definitely not with me. I felt like I didn't have power, so I was fighting for power. Mm. Whereas now, I got asked recently, like, oh, are you a jealous person? What would happen if, like, a girl came up to Kamal? And I was like, generally, like, I, I'm actually not that bothered. Yeah. And normally because I know how amazing I am. <laughs> and, <laughs> but that's, that to me is way more powerful. I, I don't feel like any stress. I don't feel like any negative emotions. But it takes away the power from Kamal. I think before I felt like Kamal had the power because his actions would depend therefore on my emotions. So whatever he did depended on how I behaved and how I reacted. So if I got angry, I was able to blame it on Kamal, but equally he was then able to do whatever he wanted to do to control my emotions. That's how I felt. Um, not because he'd taken the power away from me, but I'd given him that by saying I have no personal responsibility. Whereas now I'm like, oh no, I'm pretty great. Whatever he does, I know that I, I did the right thing and I'm better. So as long as I can sit with the fact that I'm better, it doesn't really matter. And therefore I have the power because Kamal can do whatever he wants. But I have the personal responsibility to be like, oh, I'm just a better person than you then, basically. <laughs> and that means more to me, in all honesty. And that's how you what shifted the idea of, of being a, a jealous partner, a jealous person kind of thing. Yeah, I think I'd always had like personal responsibility in most areas of my life, like education, school, work, f like normal personal responsibility. I guess in relationships, just had a baby and I was a bit like, oh, I feel like I just want, I want to trap everyone in this like <laughs> confined space. So I know what everyone is doing at all times of the day because then I'll feel happy Obviously, you never feel happy and you can't trap anyone in a house that's called kidnapping or <laughs> I'd probably get arrested. Um, so everyone goes and lives their life. But because you your life has drastically changed and you don't know what's going on and you can't live the same life because your body's changed. You've got a kid there. You can't go out whenever you want. That sort of like male interaction, you don't really see it because you're with a baby and you only go out during the day so when Kamal was going to events in the evening and stuff I was like who was that I remember one event you went to and there was like a woman talking oh. just a normal woman talking <laughs> and I was like who is that woman and he was late from the event and I just like questioned him but there was nothing that he could say <laughs> that would make me feel any better because yeah. I'm all because I didn't have any control over your actions yeah. I can't so Eventually you get to a point, my mum has always been forever harsh on me and she literally was like, you need to come off the pill yeah. and Kamal's going to do what he wants, so do what you want because this is ridiculous. And 
Um, I mean, she used more other profanities, <laughs> I, I won't say. But um, from that um, moment, I was like, yeah, it's really true, actually. So mm-hmm. I came with the pill, turned out the pill made me more psycho than normal. But I think once I also made the decision to be like, he's going to do what he wants, you be the best person that you want to be, be the best mother, be the best, like, fiancé at the time, but now wife. Yeah. And then if he decides to do something, fine. Yeah. I know I deserve more. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, really. Fair. So. Fair. And, yeah, it's just the same shift, really, from a relationship standpoint, of all I can do is do the best, be the best partner I can, so I'll just do that. And if anything off the back of that goes wrong, then, all right, cool. But it wasn't my fault. It wasn't on me. I did the best thing I possibly could. And it's so freeing. Mm. It's so freeing. Because I think, especially in the early days of like this being my first like serious relationship, it's gone past six months. We've been together full time now. <laughs> and, relationships. <laughs> and like we're talking about marriage and we're engaged and it was like, whoa, this is serious. Um, the, the, protect, the protective side of you that's like, well, this has to work. This is my person. Like it made it makes you a little bit paranoid sometimes. Where you're like, mm, "Who's that? Who's that? What's 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 that person's intentions?" It was weird because I'm like, "I trust you, but I don't like these people around you. What are they about?" And it really, it really took took over for a while. Of like, I don't want you around these kind of people. I don't I don't like that at all. Um, and it had to get to a similar point of going, well, look, what can you control? Can you control these people? Nope. Can you control Eliza's actions? Nope. What can you control? I control my actions. I can create a, a safe place, a safe home, a happy home. It could be a supportive, loving partner. I can do all those things really well and give her enough that you, she can never turn around and say, I did this because of you and your actions, if that makes sense. So I was like, let me just focus on that. Let me shift my focus from trying to prevent possible situations and trying to control everyone else let me just go hey i'm gonna be the best version that i can possibly be and i think that version is enough to have a long healthy relationship and if it's not hey fair play that means it's not what she wants and if she doesn't want it what's the point anyway um yeah and it's just so freeing to just be like hey it's okay you can't control everyone and everything yeah i think it's like i think like that is so like that idea is so needed just in general i think firstly it makes it makes you more of a attractive person whether that be in like work or school or in a relationship when you own your movements and you're confident in your ability and what you do it makes it so much easier to go oh i actually believe you i believe what you say because when someone's flapping or like, oh, well, this happened over here and that happened over here and, uh, oh, you're asking about that last job I was in. Well, drama. It's like, I don't know what you do. I don't know what you stand for. And I don't know if you coming here is going to cause me more drama when you're flapping around (laughs) like that. It makes me think like, how can that possibly happen at every stage in your life? My mum, for example, any event that you go to, this is what she does because she's always late. But rather than my mum going... I'm late because, to be honest, really bad time management. My mum, on every single journey, will go, uh, oh, a car crashed in front of me, and then this guy got out, (laughs) and then he wasn't English, so I didn't understand what he was saying. So then we had to go to this AA office and get some interpretation. It's like, what? That doesn't happen to anybody. Um, And it could literally be like an array of stories to just explain why she was half an hour late and it's like just say i was half an hour late but to be honest a bad time management or i did i wanted to be half an hour late i didn't want to get here on time yeah yeah yeah. the other day i had to i had a dinner and they all asked why are you late why are you late and i said oh i went for a drink with a friend because in all honesty i knew you'd be sitting around waiting for food so i didn't want to be here rather than being like (laughs) oh well something so stressful happened everywhere like just take some personal responsibility and go i made a choice yeah. To not hang out with you for half an hour. Yeah. And hang out with somebody else because I preferred their company for half an hour. Like, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's life. It's and actually, it. people will be like, oh. well, I was a bit taken back because you're being so honest, but they'll respect it a lot more. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I guess moving out into the wider world, you've got the relationship angle, you've got the work angle as well, where personal responsibility is absolutely key. And then also from a social standpoint of when you're taking yourself out and you're 
out and about on the street, you're going out on evenings, etc. Like the personal responsibility of how you turn up to these places, how you carry yourself in these spaces, how you communicate with each other. Um, yeah, how how do you approach personal responsibility for yourself, Storm? When I go out. When when you're out in the real world, I guess, like when you're going out, when you're thinking about your professional life, where where is the line between your responsibility and and what everyone else needs to be doing? I think I just understand that I'm responsible for me and I'm not afraid of consequences for the actions that I chose to do. Mm. So I think it's more like, I don't have to consciously be like, I'm going to take responsibility. It's just (laughs) more like, I decided to do it or I decided not to do it and I executed it. So now what follows, that was my choice. I made the conscious decision. So I'm not really scared of consequence. So I don't really, I don't really have to think about it. I just live. Yeah. And if I did something, I'm like, yeah, I did that. If I didn't do it, I'm like, I didn't do it. You just own it fully. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's never been an issue for me. So, like, conversations like this are very weird for mm. me because I'm just like, I don't understand how people cannot take responsibility for things that they do. Like, if you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong. Mm. If you're in the right, you're in the right. And it's very, like, black and white for me. Yeah. But I think where it gets blurred is when there's, like, multiple factors at play. And okay. then it's like, who takes responsibility and to what extent? But like on a general day to day, it's more like I did it. Mm. We're here now. Yeah, fair, fair. So I remember there was a, and, and I never took the time to really go into it because it just seemed like drama. But all I remember on on this story that popped up online was this person went onto a podcast, arrived there early. They served loads of drinks. She drank loads with them, and then it turned into like this argument later mm. on on the actual show, and then. Yeah. After this argument, she went online and said, this person um, gets all their guests drunk and takes advantage of them. And, and it sort of blew up into this bigger thing. And it was really interesting from an outside looking in going, hold on, you've, you've given this explanation. But for the first 60 seconds of this video, you just told me how much you drank. I came in, I had the whiskey, then I had this, then I had this. And like she was listing all the different alcohols. And I was like, hold on, you went to a, a I feel like a professional place. It's a podcast. Mm. And they offered drinks and you took it. Mm-hmm. And not just one, you took. And you had like seven or eight. And then it blew up into this big argument. And at that point, when you're that inebriated, you're you're not going to be having a reasonable argument. So everything's going to be times 10, times 20. So it was yeah. really interesting to hear her put the responsibility over there. And then they in return were like, well, no, it's you. You came and did it. And it was like, actually, where does the responsibility lie there? Surely she should own it. And then if they did anything, they should own it. But it felt like it was just a purely your fault, your fault, your fault. Yeah, I think in that conversation, it wasn't, that conversation wasn't had to come to a conclusion or to come to a, like a solution. That conversation was had just to argue. So both parties mm. went to it, not looking to have any sort of like mean, meaningful conversation. They, yeah. looked, they went into it just to argue because, you know, views and clout. <laughs> but I think with, with that situation, she did say like, no one forced me to drink. That was my choice. So in yeah. all fairness, she did say, like, I I did that. That's on me. Okay. But I think what she was trying to say was, you knew I was intoxicated, but you still tried to do this, even right. after I said no. I think that was her argument. But then his argument was, that didn't happen. <laughs> Full stop. Yeah, he was like, I didn't do that. Or I think it was something more of the lines of, like, this. it was like a blurred circumstance, basically. Of course, because there's alcohol involved, so no one can actually remember accurately. Yeah, and I think the hosts do drink as well, so it's not as if, like, we're like we're sober yeah. and we're just going to get you guys drunk. It was more like... That's the environment I create. Yeah, like, if yeah. you watch the podcast, everyone on the podcast drinks. So if you're going on the podcast, you're expecting to drink. Like she said, no one forced you to drink that much. Mm. So you decided to drink that much. Obviously, when you drink a lot, arguments yeah. happen. Yeah. There's conflict whatever yeah um i agree with what you guys said though when when she went online and she was like screaming and shouting yeah. it makes you look it doesn't make you look like you can articulate yourself it doesn't make you look like you're responsible yeah but i would be mad too so i'm kind <laughs> of like I'm, I'm very like i'm tiptoeing both sides because yeah. i can see it from her perspective if i went out with my friends for example mm-hmm. and we were drinking because you know we're adults we can make that decision and then something happened of course, I would be mad too. But in the same breath, I was there. And when if I wasn't there... Happened. So he tried to kiss her. Yeah. She said was, no. Yeah, apparently he was like trying to kiss her. She said no. 
And then because she said no, he reacted quite negatively and got kind of nasty and was saying stuff about her and whatever, whatever. On the podcast live? Yeah, it, it was yeah. either on the podcast or after the podcast. But because they've got big following, it's like when you say something bad about someone online. See, that's strange because I would say that you wouldn't be annoyed. I would. I know I could probably get on here and I could say something really bad about you. Yeah. I don't think you'd care. It just depends. I think I would <laughs> I would only care in that circumstance because I know you only said that because I rejected you. So it's more like now you want to be petty, so I'm going to be petty. And me being petty is getting mad at you being petty. So it's a tit for tat. But if it was like... Like you said, if you got on... To, first of all, I'd be like, Eliza, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> but, like, yeah, I wouldn't get that mad. But I think her re- her reaction, although it was kind of in her head appropriate for what happened to her, I think the way that she went about it, coming on live, screaming and shouting, mm. not really saying what her point was, that's why everyone's so confused, I think. Yeah. She handled it very wrong, and now it doesn't... If she was going to, like, get serious about it, there's always going to be that thing where, well, you were online screaming and shouting, acting a fool, so that's your character now, in an outside perspective's point of view. Yeah. No, fair. I think with with growing up and becoming an adult and having these freedoms where you can go out and you can drink with friends, where you can be at social events without family there are certain things that I I just think you as an individual, you've got to take on as your personal responsibility. It it upsets me so much when we've been out in Leeds, for example, and seen uh, someone on their own crying. And it's like, hold on, why are you on your own? One, where are your friends? Two, what's going on? We've literally walked people over to police stations, (laughs) checked into hotels, etc. for people. Because at some point you've lost your personal responsibility of let me make sure I'm with my friends. Let me make sure I'm only drinking an amount that I can handle myself. Um, let me make sure I've got a plan on getting home. Let me make sure everyone knows where I am. And those kind of, I think, basic things that as you become an adult, you've got to take full responsibility on as you start to explore the social world and, and that kind of thing. So I feel like when I see these things online, I get a bit like, no, don't don't create a culture where we're cool with everyone passing responsibility because then we get the other side where people say, ah, if anything happens, it's everyone else's fault and we start to act reckless or we start to not act with with deeper or clear thought. Um, So yeah, that's why I bring it up because I think even though a lot of our audience are students, we've got six formers and they'll be going out. We've got college, we've got uni students and they're definitely going out. Mm -hmm. And for those younger students, I, I want them to know in advance, hey, make sure you're carrying yourself in a certain way and you've got a group of friends you trust you've got plans you're treating everything and it sounds like I'm being paranoid but I just think treat everything with that level of seriousness I guess even though it's just going out for an evening and and being with friends Uh, my best solution obviously is just don't drink at all ever it's funny I think like all those things can be solved really just from the foundation of knowing yourself that girl's brand online because mm. after I watched that video I then get obviously advertised every single video she's ever taken part in and yeah. it's dreadful yeah right. um, yeah. and I think people have to be very very careful of the person that they want to be and I, we were having this conversation the other day it is absolutely lovely to see people from Geordie Shore mm. and Love Island settle down um, but don't forget like that the way that they built that fame and that money is on the foundation of how they sold themselves back yeah. in the day. And you can't take that back, especially with the internet now. Anything that you post will be there forever. And as long as you're fine with that being your brand, fine, yeah, happy. But realistically, if someone from Geordie Shaw came in and complained about someone's behaviour... And then someone from BBC News came in and complained about someone's behaviour and they were going against one another. Sadly, I would believe the person from BBC News. Not on the foundation that everything they say is true. And whether that is right or wrong, my initial thought is someone from Geordie Shaw can't be believed because of how they behaved back in the day. And I don't agree with that. But what I do know, and having studied psychology for many years, is that person's brand and that stereotype that you fall into will remain in people's heads for the rest of time. 
um, you can present how you want someone to behave around you. And I do believe that someone's behavior and how you come across will affect that next person's behavior and how they come across. If I walk into a room and I scream and shout, or if I lay the foundations of being someone drunk and not well-educated and not well-spoken, people know they can take the piss. Mm. If I hold myself quite well and I can speak quite well and I talk about the education that I've had, suddenly I'm a little bit more threatening than I was before. Yeah. So you need to be wary of how you come across and how you want to be come across. But I think that is completely dependent on how well you know yourself. I had friends that didn't know themselves very well and they did end up throwing up round down alleyways <laughs> and getting into fights with people because when you don't know yourself, you're very easily maneuvered by the group. If the group want you to be the funny one, if the yeah. group want you to drink the most, if the yeah. group want you to do this, you say yes. And they'll do that mm -hmm. because people want entertainment and it's free entertainment and I can do it to you. Great, fantastic. I don't need to be the entertainment for the night. You can and I can have a great time taking the mick out of you. And I don't have to deal with any of the consequences either because I've, I've got you to do it. Right. Yeah, 100%. I always knew growing up that I, I had work Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So the amount that I drink was dependent on that. And so... I, I knew my limits quite early on. I was like, fine, I know I need to get up. And I know also, weirdly, I wanted to be, I always knew I wanted to be a mum and I wanted to get married and have kids. So mm. I was like, cool, I'll, I want to come across to these guys that see me, not as girlfriend material, not as having a great time with. Mm. I want them to see me as if they could get married to me. So in most mornings I'd wake up, I'd make them breakfast, la la la, do mm. all of that because that ticked my box of my identity. And people took the mick out of me the whole entire time. Oh, I bet everyone has that to say. They had much more respect for me than yeah. the way they spoke about other people yeah. afterwards. And when it was just the boys and I was there, the way they spoke about those other people was horrific. Mm. Like, horrific. And I was just thankful that I wasn't that yeah. person yeah. being spoken about like that. Not only for me, but imagine if their parents had heard or yeah. if their older sibling had heard because then that gets spread across That's their right. the older year literal. groups and future employers that could have been mine. And I just don't want that. Mm. I don't want that branding. So um, I think it's all about like the only thing you need to do is how well do I know myself? What do I want to get out of life? And it could literally be fame. And if it's fame, go ahead, be on Geordie Shore. <laughs> For me, it would have never have worked because I wanted to be married and I wanted to have kids slightly less attractive when you go on something like Geordie Shaw and especially not something that I would ever want my yeah. kids to see. So, but that was me and I knew that quite early. I was saying to Kamal, we were talking about our first Valentine's gifts and I was like, <laughs> from very early, I had a strong moral code and a boy that gave me a Valentine's Day necklace had a girlfriend, year four or five, and he was like... Um, oh, if you be my Valentine, I'll leave my girlfriend now. And from that moment, I was like, no, I'll take the necklace because that's a gift that you gave me. <laughs> but me and you, like, I don't ever want to talk to you again because I just think it's gross that you had a girlfriend and you bought me a necklace. It's not something you're supposed to do. And I really fancied the boy, actually. It was very good looking. <laughs> but, like, my moral code just wouldn't let me move. And I was only, I was, like, 10, 11. Yeah. But I just think... It, it's not about age, it's not about getting to know the world, it's just, we all know what's right or wrong pretty early. So decide what's right or wrong for you. And it's not the same for every person. No, I, I literally decided, point blank, I'm not drinking alcohol till I'm 17, 18. No, 18, so I'm 18. I was like, just not doing it, not interested. Um, I think you have the odd tipple with family, where you could the have... Odd tipple. The odd tipple? Say... <laughs> I've never in my life heard someone say that word. What, tipple? Yeah. Tipple, a tipple. It's such an odd that. thing to say. Uh, the odd tipple, no? No. Patrick, tipple. <laughs> See, Patrick's heard it. The old tipple. Wild. That is oh, wild. wild. That is wild. <clears throat> uh, a little drop of alcohol here and there. But I'm talking like Caribbean twist, 4% in a glass, that kind of vibe. And going out with friends, everyone was drinking, especially like on a Friday night down at the wreck. You know, it starts off playing football the and all fine. Field, by the, way. the wreck is, the wreck's a big park. It's a field. Uh, yeah, it's a big field. Um, but we go down there, some, some do skateboarding, some of us kick a ball about, and then as the evening comes, they, they start to go and buy their cider and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, come on, do you want to drink? No. And then it started off with, ah, oh, he doesn't drink. It started off with, like, the banter you have to deal with. But you get through that little banter period, and everyone's like, cool, come on, doesn't drink. So 
after a while on a Friday, they come down, cider, 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 oh, Kamal, Lucas Aid. And it wasn't even a conversation anymore. It was just fine, cool, that's who Kamal is, we move. Um, house party, same issue, same thing. Alcohol, alcohol, oh, here you go. And because you know yourself and you set those standards, people then shift slightly and start to respect that standard and that's how, how people deal with you. Um, and I think right now, whilst you're going through education or if you're a bit older, even the little things you're doing are making a big difference. When I can be in a class, be a bit bored, trigger you to do something funny, I'm now entertained. I've got my free entertainment. Teachers not going to go at me. I'm not doing anything. I'm here sat down. I've got you to be the funny person. So you take the L and you walk out. I know because I used to be that guy and I've done the funny thing. Uh -huh, look at me walking out. And then you're still outside on your own like an idiot while they're cracking on with their lesson and not getting in trouble. And they might come out and give you like a little spud on their way out to their next lesson <laughs> while you're still outside waiting for the principal. There's just really, really important things you've got to do with yourself. Get to know yourself. Get to know what you're about, your morals, your values, your ideals. Uh, Can I say that that drinking thing followed you when we were older? I don't know if you remember. We bumped into the one of the guys that you used to hang out with and he was like, he said to me, oh, you know, you've got one of the great ones because Kamal wouldn't even drink alcohol when all of us are like drinking and smoking down at the wreck. And I was like, that's Hilarious. what I'd want to hear about the man that I get married to. I wouldn't want to hear like, oh, when we all got <laughs> drunk in the field that time. <laughs> like, and, and so for me in that moment, like probably about, what seven years later Jeez. i was like fair that's hilarious Came back up yeah a choice from when i was 12 13 14 years old but what i would say is whilst you are kind of like under the age of 18 that most of you probably would be you're allowed to give away some of your responsibilities so whilst you're not like responsible for everything learn how to be responsible for your little actions because when you are older and you hit 18, as soon as you hit 18, you're an adult, and everything that you do falls on you. It doesn't matter if you're still living with your parents, it doesn't matter any other circumstance. In the eyes of everyone, you're an adult. And if you've already developed how to take responsibility for yourself in your younger years, it's a lot easier to do it in your older years. So, yeah, just while you have the time, just take responsibility for the little things. And then when you have to take responsibility for the big things, they don't seem as big because you're used to being like, yeah, that's for me. You've so. done the training. You've done the reps. Yeah. You're ready for the real thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Ah, oh, beautiful. Well, I feel like, I feel like that's our time. I feel like that's our time. It's been a beautiful episode today, man. A little personal responsibility. Uh, it goes a long way. Makes you stand out and pff, there, there's no downside. <laughs> there's actually zero downside to having personal responsibility. Um, so thank you thank you both for joining us today on the podcast it's been beautiful do we do our egg now or do we play the music and then wait how does this work again we had this exact conversation last time I know we need to make a system you gotta, you gotta let the people who are just here oh yeah for the, for the time being to, to go if you're a casual listener thank you very much goodbye well now they're gonna still be here because they're like why are you sending me away mm you got to kind of just like let it fade out and then just be like, hi. Right. You know how you. Marvel do it where they play like half an hour of credits. Oh, those credits are so long. <laughs> yeah, that's but I'm not point. leaving. That's I'm not leaving. Point. They want the people who are there to be there. Fair. To stay there and right. find the Easter eggs. Got it. Got it. Well done. I was hoping that you would understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you've done it. You've you spoken your language there. Absolutely. Good communication skills. Thank you everyone for watching. We will see you next week. Peace. live in the studio with with patrick axe at the at the helms uh Kamal was on the sound uh storm and eliza were both on a microphone each i mean let's be real we're the reason why people watch you know? <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> we are the talent <laughs> if you are still here it's because you're a real one you're a real one um and basically all you have to do uh is drop us a message on instagram or linkedin with the message uh responsibility just say, just say the word responsibility, that's it. And then um, we'll send you a free Amy or Hire shirt in your size, direct to your home or your school, wherever you want it collected. Um, and it'll be yours. Can we say like the first three? Uh, yes, great point. Because it was the first one gets a t-shirt and the then the two that follow get a response. Yeah. 
The first one will get. Do you know what? You explain. We just did explain. I don't know yeah. why you did a whole. The first, all well, the first one to send the message gets a t-shirt, and then the next two will get wristbands. Come on, she's gonna be sending out t-shirts. <laughs> oh, this could have been such an expensive mistake. But for real, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Peace.